uh, and I want you to book as well. Uh, the book is an alternative Ulster, 1977 to 1982, and it's called It Makes You Want to Spit. Wonderful title. And it's to do with, uh, well, if you like, the history of punk uh, as it relates to Northern Ireland, written by two real fans. And uh, to review it, we have the sports columnist with the uh, Irish Examiner and deputy editor who wrote Hot Press, uh, and a man I've known for many, many years, and that's uh, Liam Mackey. Liam, welcome. Too, too uh, many years, Martin. Too, oh, it doesn't matter. We, doesn't remember, matter. we remember this music. We remember this around. when it was peculiarly strange yeah, to, uh, to many other people. However, welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you. Um, we are of an age, uh, as many of us are now, who have come through the system. Uh, punk was a, a revolution. Um, your opinion on, on, on that era, is, uh, as your memory gives it to you now, before we get into the book, what do you think of the era? Well, the era, for me at the time, sort of 18, it was perfect yeah. because, uh, I mean, what I, I wasn't a punk. I didn't have the nerve to be a punk. And me, I was too much of a coward. Yeah, me ma wouldn't yeah. let me be a punk. Yeah. But I, I was uh, the sort of rookie journalist in hot press in those days, so it fell to me by virtue of age to cover the scene. Oh. And what I remember was just great energy and a sense of anything was possible and, and a great creative outburst. And that, that, was, that was the hallmark of punk. Uh, I mean, for the kind of mainstream audience that didn't understand it, and when does a mainstream audience ever understand and youth culture, it appeared to be the Visigoths arriving at the door, the yeah. barbarians at the gates. For the people involved, it was about music, it was about fanzines, the do-it-yourself magazines, it was about graphic design and getting a chance to do all that stuff on their own terms. And it was also, if you like, it was uh, the very antithesis of, of disco. Oh, completely. And the super group. Do you remember mm. all that mm. in the 70s, which is the mm. big thing? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the title of the book, it makes me want to spit, one of, one of the least attractive <laughs> yes, it was, it was, it wasn't aspects attractive yeah. of punk rock was the idea that the fans, uh, by way of expressing themselves, had won with the artists. Yes. And eliminating that gap you spoke about between corporate rock and the fans, yes. uh, would express their affection by spitting at the, at the bands. Which Even was now, in, on reflection, I still think it was somewhat unnecessary. Yeah, I, I remember interviewing a lot of the bands at the time, and I don't remember a single artist who thought this was a good idea because those guys were on the receiving Absolutely. end. Absolutely. And this was, this was of course some sort of, you could glory in this, couldn't you? The well, fans you see, did well, it, well you. it was meant to be an expression of affection and yes. also saying you're not above us, you're on our level. It was one of those weird things, but it was a minor aspect. They give it the, the, the book that title because it's a catchy title, as yeah, you said. Sure. Yeah, what's yeah, this yeah. About? But there was more serious stuff going on. Tell me about your, your thoughts about Sean O'Neill and Guy Trevor, the guys who wrote this. What, what well, I think it's great. I mean, I, it's funny, you know, as we sit back and what nearly... 30 years ago now, it's Thank extraordinary. We're yes. over, it, this is over it's a quarter right. of a century yes, ago, yeah. which is mind blowing. But yeah. I, I can't imagine anyone involved in that scene, either in Belfast or down here in Dublin or in London or anywhere else, thought that some 30 years later there'd be a kind of a lavish coffee table book commemorating what went on. But I'm glad these guys did it. And I know some of the people involved, and it was a real labour of love. And okay, it's an exercise in nostalgia. And if you're from Bangor or Roma or Portadown, there's parts of this book that'll mean everything to you and very little to anybody else. Yes. But as a document, not just of a, of a period in music, but also of social history in the North. Well, that's, that's this what I'm curious a, about. Yeah. You see, what I'm curious about, we're going to show a clip in a moment of the undertones just to bring us. Yeah. Because that's great. Because it's always good <laughs> to I show can. the undertones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you look back at it, um, particularly in the North, uh, punk seemed to have a real influence. Yeah. And of course, the violence that was going on there at the time. Yeah. This arrived and, well, I presume, brought people together. Well, that's uh, what comes across in this book, and it's written by people who were there and who were involved, is this sense that this was one of the first non-sectarian small but significant youth movements in right. the north. Yeah. So people came to, in a sense, what a punk was largely about was people who felt alienated from everything else that was going on around them. Now, you couldn't be more alienated in the, than, than in the north of Ireland if you weren't part of the tribes and you weren't yes. active in yeah. fostering so the this sectarianism. Was your if you were alienated from all that, then you had punk. Right. Uh, and it was non-sectarian. It was not secret because they came together in the Harp Bar and all that mattered was whether you had you know, the right piercings, the right safety pins, and the right fanzines and the right records. It yeah. didn't matter whether you were Catholic Which or Which is the cool way to be. And they say that in the book, that this, this, was, this was never an issue. Now, yeah. it, you know, simmering under the surface always were some of the tribal Sadly. things. And Joe Strummer of The Clash later caused consternation, and they talk about it in the book. Before when, we do the undertones, by the way, I yeah. want to go to, to a clip. This is kind of a vox pop. Let's have a look at this. Sure. Um, and we'll come back to, uh, to this. <laughs> Oh, I have to keep my opinion to myself. <laughs> I'm about quarters. <laughs> OK, 
say anything? Well, you know, sort of, you see people going around with their hairs and safety pins and... Well, I think it's just a fad. You don't, you don't have any... No, the wee boy in the house, and he, he's going mad about it. It's only 11, like, you know, he'll grow out of it, but... Okay, thanks a lot. It's just a fad, like the Kevin Keegan haircut. It's fantastic. Um, and, we, and we now are the old woman. Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, Maisie. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so you want to say something well, just, uh, that, that, John T. That, Davis? Yeah, that film, Shell Shock Rock, is by a guy called John T. Davis, who's, who's very much an acclaimed documentary filmmaker now and has a lot of credits to That's his right. name. That was the first thing he did, and he did it on an absolutely shoestring budget. And in fact, it was originally going to be shown at the Cork Film Festival, and then they got cold feet about it and said it wasn't up to technical standard. They later went back and did show it, and it has won awards all over the world. But uh, on the day he was due to come down for what was supposed to have been the premiere, and they got the word that it wasn't going to be shown. He was standing on a street in Belfast with a man called Terry Hooley, who you'll remember was the founder of Good Vibrations yes. Records, who gave the undertones their first Which break. Which huge. And Terry and John were standing, and John had gone to the trouble, he says in the book, of ironing a shirt for the first time in his life for this big trip to Cork. And Terry was never the most glamorous figure, but they were standing on the pavement, pretty bewildered, because this whole trip was off. And Terry was drinking from a can of Coke, and they were just standing in silence. And American tourists came by and dropped a few coins into <laughs> Terry's, can, right. Terry's can of Coke. And at the end of that movie, which we won't, I know we're going to no. see another clip, we won't see that at the very end, John really wanted to have rolling credits at the end of the movie, like a proper movie, but he couldn't afford them. And he explains in the book that what he did was he got a toy train set and he wrote the script white on black background and he put them on the engine and on the carriages and he put a camera overhead on a tripod and ran the toy train and he got his rolling credits. That's gorgeous. Yeah, and that, you know, that's also about punk. It was, it you know, DIY, do yeah, it yourself. Yeah, do it yourself. Yeah. And everybody could play an instrument. That and whole thing well, well, they couldn't, but they went no, ahead and played it anyway. You that know. was the belief. Yeah, yeah. Listen, you, the undertones, you mentioned the undertones earlier. I just want to show, I just love this page of most of these. Yeah, yeah. But you have too. Yeah. Uh, from our memory banks. These are uh, the singles that they released all those years ago. Uh, Fergal Sharkey, you have news on him in a second. Let's have a look at him then. Okay. And then we'll get the new news on him now. This here comes summer. Ooh, baby, baby, what can I do? You know you're driving crazy when I'm looking at you. But summer's been here and it's time to come out. Time to discover the fun is about. Here comes the summer. Here comes the summer. Here comes the summer. Keep a look up on the fields with the faces of the air. The beach is up under the sun. So the long legs wind in the sun. We're like two old men on the park bench here. <laughs> I remember it well. Now, Pogo pogoing on the city. Pogoing. Now, you have a story about, about uh, today, Fergal Sharkey. Well, well, I said earlier, you know, 30 years later, who'd have thought we'd produce a lavish coffee table book out of punk rock? Who'd have thunk back yes. in Derry in 1977 that Fergal Sharkey would have been appointed by Tony Blair, as he was this past week, as live music czar? in England, he's, he's responsible for encouraging live music and getting bands, which in an odd way is kind of full circle. It is full circle. But we didn't think he'd be appointed by Tony no, Blair. No, it didn't then. seem at all likely, no, all those years ago. No, not at all likely, no. um, Final one, answer, one word answer, was punk good or bad for? Oh, it was, neither, it was neither good nor bad, it was great. <laughs> I love it. It was great. Uh, it makes you want to spit, though. An alternative Ulster, there it is, the definitive guide to punk in Northern Ireland, Sean O'Neill and Guy Trelford. Uh, and there it is. Uh, go by if, uh, if that's what you like. You're a gentleman. Good to see you again. All right, Marty. Do Take come it back easy. Again, yep. Thank you. Really good. Really enjoy it.